there's a part of practicing meditation that doesn't really challenge the values we grew up with. Finding a quiet place in the mind, having a place where you can rest and relax. Everybody can understand that there's a place for that. And so when the mind is feeling really frazzled, it's very easy to see that meditation is something you want to learn how to master. That concentration, getting the mind still, finding some seclusion where you can let go. is something easy to understand and to see the value of. But then our society gives only so much space for that. Once you've rested and relaxed, then it's time to get back to work, the kind of work that they encourage. And this is where the practice of the Dharma parts ways not only with American culture, but what you may call domestic culture at large. Because the work that needs to be done is viewed in a very different way from the point of view of the Dharma. There's a story that when Mahabhajapati was first ordained, she went to see the Buddha and asked for a a short Dharma teaching that she could use in her practice. And he taught her about eight different values that would determine what is Dharma and what's not Dharma. And when you look at them carefully, you realize a lot of them go against what our ordinary domestic culture encourages. They fall into three groups. One has to do with the attitudes you develop in your practice. One has to do with how you relate to other people as you practice, and then the final one has to deal with the real values in terms of the goals of the practice. And they go away, they go against our ordinary culture. And this is why Dharma practice can be difficult. But it's also why monasteries are important places, not just for monks to stay, but also for lay people to have their opportunity to come and step out of domestic culture for a while. To look around and see, well, what do you really believe? What do you really hold important in your life? The eight values are these. In terms of the qualities you develop in the practice, there's contentment, shedding, and persistence. Contentment means basically being content with what you've got in terms of your physical surroundings, food, clothing, shelter, medicine, that kind of thing. And it's not really good for the economy. There was a period back in the 50s when American advisors went over to Thailand. They were afraid that Thailand was going to become the next Vietnam. And they actually sent a lot of sociologists out to study Thai values, Thai village life. And they came back with the conclusion that Buddhism was not really good for a capitalistic economy because it taught contentment. And so word actually went out from the Thai government to the monks throughout the country, stop teaching contentment. Everybody laughed, because they realized that that's an important part of the Dharma. You can't just drop this for the sake of developing a consumer economy. And of course, over the years things have changed in Thailand, but that's one thing we've got to look at. To what extent do you want your life to be dominated by the acquisition of things? Being dissatisfied with what you've got, wanting something more. Because as you notice, as TV moves into a country, and in Thailand it was very dramatic because it came so quickly. When you watch a lot of advertisements, it makes you miserable. 
you see all the things that other people have that you don't have. And the advertisements are designed to make you want them to see that kind of life as attractive. So it's good to step away from a society that has those kind of views to remind yourself that's not where the meaning of life is. It's in learning to be content with things outside you, because you've got to be persistent in another way. The persistence here is persistence in developing the mind, working on the qualities of the mind. And domestic society goes along with that to some extent, but we start talking about abandoning sensuality, abandoning our possessiveness, abandoning our idea of self. That goes against ordinary values, and you need a lot of help in that direction. Similarly with shedding, most of us have had a life of accumulating, gathering up this, gathering up that, not only material things, but also our pride, the things that we're proud of having accomplished, the abilities we have. Whatever it is that we hold on to, that we feel makes us better than the people around us. Those are the things the Buddha said you've got to let go of, you've got to put down, you've got to shed. Which again goes against a lot of our acquired values. So those are just three of the eight. And the rest of them also go against ordinary values of society, in terms of our relationships with other people. We want to be modest. We want to be unburdensome. We want to be unentangled. And that goes against what society wants. They want, they want us to find our happiness in our relationships. And to get ahead and work, you've really got to assert yourself. Advertise what a fine person you are. And as for being unburdensome, on the face of it, it might sound simply like a version of being frugal. But it goes deeper than that. The Buddha says one of the main ways that we place a burden on the world is by creating more people, having a family and then having to support that family. So the ideal, ideal way of being unburdensome is to be celibate. You just don't create new people. That goes against the values of domestic society in a very direct way. And then finally there's the goal. The goal is to be unfettered and to have dispassion. Every time I've talked about dispassion to groups of people, there, there's a lot of discomfort around that. It sounds like someone who's dead. But that's not the case. You learn to free yourself, because your passions are fetters, things that tie you down. Now, as you practice, you've got to develop a sense of passion for the Dharma. But eventually even that is something you will eventually let go of. When you've found a true happiness, you don't have to be passionate about anything. And you're not dead. you simply found what you want. you found what you needed. Something that really is satisfying and that doesn't need to be shored up and that doesn't have to be looked after. So these are the values of the Dharma. And it's good to be clear on the fact that they do go against or normal values of our culture. And not just our culture, it's not a matter of taking on Asian values as opposed to American values. Because even in Asia, even in the time of the Buddha, these eight values ran against the society. So as we're meditating, we have to realize it's not just relaxation, it's not just resting so we can go back to our ordinary lives. We're thinking about a happiness that goes beyond the ordinary, beyond the typical. And we're learning the tools as we meditate 
that allow us to pull back and choose our own direction. Because as you're sitting here, a lot of those values of society are sitting in your head as well. And the question is, how much do you really want to follow them? And if you don't, how are you going to pry yourself loose of them? Because you've identified so much with, with many of them. Take sensuality, for instance. A lot of our society is built on that. According to the Buddha, it's a fetter. It's something that ties us down and keeps us coming back again and again and again to be disappointed again and again. And so when it comes up in your mind, what are you going to do? Society has already provided you with lots of arguments for why this is a good thing. If you don't give in to your sensual desires, you're going to get twisted and distorted. Like that old Ken Russell movie years back, where poor old Vanessa Redgrave has been a nun for so long that she can't even walk with her head straight. She's been so warped by her celibate life. That's the attitude our society has. But if you go over to Thailand and you meet the Great Johns, you realize these are really happy people. And a lot of their freedom comes from their ability to overcome their sensual desires. So what weapons are you going to use? Well, the same ones we're using as we meditate. The Buddha talks about three kinds of fabrication. There's bodily fabrication, which is the breath. Verbal fabrication, which is the way you talk to yourself about things. You direct your thought to a topic and you evaluate it. These are the sentences with which you describe things in your mind. And then there's mental fabrication, which is perception and feeling. These kind of the raw materials from which you might talk about things. Feelings of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And the images that the mind throws up for itself. And when a really strong emotion comes in the mind, you have to learn to realize it gets made of these same three things. But while we're meditating, we're learning to gain some control over them. You gain some control over the way you breathe. You learn to gain some control over the way you talk to yourself about things when you're sitting here with a breath. How do you talk to yourself in a way that keeps you interested in the breath and allows you to play with the breath and adjust the breath so it's a really nice place to be? And then there are the feelings that arise from the way you relate to the breath and then the perceptions you use to keep yourself with the breath or to make, <clears throat> to make the breath more refined. You can think of the breath as something you have to pull in from outside, or you can think of it as an energy that swells up from within. The perception of pulling in is a perception of hunger, but a perception of the breath rising up from within, each little cell swelling up. and in that way getting the air to come in through the lungs. That's a different kind of perception of the breath, and it's going to have an effect on the way you breathe. If you hold in mind the image that the breath is just able to come through those two little holes in your nose, that's going to create a lot of pressure, especially when you've got a cold. Your nose gets stuffed up. But if you hold in mind the perception of breath openings all over the body. Every little pore is a possible breath opening. What does that do to the way you breathe? You begin to see that, the power of perception over a physical process like this. So you're getting some hands-on experience with these three kinds of fabrication. And then you want to learn how to use these three kinds of fabrications as you've mastered them to deal with other emotions that come up. Say there's a really strong sensual desire. We'll learn to look at it as those three things. There's the impact it has on your breath. There are the stories you weave around it, and there are the basic perceptions you hold in mind. And every desire is going to have all three parts. 
Sometimes the desire comes on and it seems just like a brute force. But if you take it on simply as a brute force, you've fallen for one of its tricks right there. It has its reasons, but usually its reasons are really bad. That's why it's using force. It's like a bully on the schoolyard. The bully has bad reasons for wanting to beat you up, so he just beats you up. doesn't want to talk about it. Just uses brute force. So what brute force do you have to respond? Well, you want to use all three. In terms of the force, of course, there's the energy of the breath. Can you change the way you breathe around a particular sensation of breathing in the body? How about relaxing the backs of your hands, relaxing the tops of your feet, relaxing your wrists? What does that do to the force equation inside the body? Then look at the stories you're telling yourself about that sensual desire. Part of it will say, this is how you're going to find happiness. If you don't find happiness this way, you're going to be starved. You have to remind yourself, you've been looking for happiness that way who knows how many lifetimes. It's the same old stuff over and over and over again. How about trying to find a new way of happiness? If this kind of happiness were really all that good, everybody in the world would be happy because they're all finding sensual pleasures. But look at everybody's miserable. There's never enough. As the Buddha once said, if gold coins fell down from the sky as rain, it still wouldn't be enough for our sensual desires. And there are all those suttas in the canon where the Buddha talks about the person who's able to overcome sensuality as a true soldier, the warrior who really is victorious. So the fact that we're not pursuing our sensual desires is not a sign of weakness or being wimps. It's just it's the other way around. So those are some of the verbal fabrications you might use. And then there's finally the mental fabrication, those basic perceptions, the parts that deal with your lizard brain. Something deep down inside says, you know, sensual pleasures, sensuality, something really attractive, really appealing. It's where you get real satisfaction. But how about looking into the other side, looking at the whole thing? And John Lee has a really fine passage in his autobiography where he's made up his mind that he wants to disrobe. This is when he was very young as a monk. But then he decides he really should prepare himself mentally for what it's going to be like. And so he starts thinking about what would happen. In the beginning, it's a really nice fantasy. He gets the woman he wants, the best job he can think that he can probably get. But then he realizes that's as good as it gets, and then it goes downhill from there. And he ends up, the woman he wants dies, leaves him with a kid. He ends up getting another wife. She has a kid, and then, of course, there's turmoil in the family. He's able to look at the picture from all sides. And that's what got him out of that particular desire. Well, there's a story in the canon of a monk, Sundara Samuda, this is, was his name. He was doing walking meditation one day, and he had this vision of a gorgeous woman standing at the, the end of the path, her hands palm to palm in front of her chest, saying, Why are you wasting your young life as a, as a monk? When you're young, that's the time for sensual pleasures. Come and enjoy sensual pleasures with me, and then when we're both old, then we can both become monks and nuns, and after we've tasted these pleasures. And in that moment, instead of falling for the image, he had this perception, this is what the snare of death is. This is a trap, and this is how the trap is disguised. And holding that perception in mind, he was able to get past that desire, and he actually had his experience of awakening. He began to realize that all the attractions of sensuality were just that. They were part of a 
the bait for a trap, death's trap. So, so the, those are some of the ways in which you use these three kinds of perceptions on the one hand to understand sensual desire, on the other hand to undo it. You realize you have the alternative. And this is an important part of the practice, is realizing a lot of things you've picked up in living in this society, living in any kind of domestic society. A lot of these attitudes that you've adopted as your attitudes are not necessarily in your own best interest. Maybe there's another kind of happiness. Maybe there's, maybe there's another way of thinking. This is why the Dharma is so valuable. They talk about how as Buddhism goes from country to country, it fits into the society where it goes. Well, the Buddhism doesn't do that. People change the Dharma as it comes to them. But the people who get the most of the, out of the Dharma are not the ones who change it to suit themselves. They're the ones who change themselves. They use the Dharma as a tool to find freedom from their cultural conditioning, from their cultural background. So it's important to keep in mind the fact that there are these alternatives. There is another way of looking for happiness. There is a freedom that lies beyond our cultural conditioning. As we're meditating, it's not just a matter of learning a relaxation technique. It's learning to look very clearly at the way we look for happiness and the type of happiness that we can imagine, and to expand our imagination, and to expand our range of tools and strategies so we can find a happiness that really is worth the effort that goes into finding it, looking for it, pursuing it. finding it and realizing it really was worth the effort. More than worth the effort, as I say. It's more than you can imagine. But it is true and it is attainable. So you always want to keep that in mind.